We're beginning a module now on Cornelius Van Til's doctrine and theology of common grace. And this first lecture will be uh, merely an introduction and overview of the doctrine of common grace in Reformed theology. Now, the lecture will not delve as deeply into the details as the following lectures. It's designed to give a general introduction and overview to orient you to the theology of common grace and to the issues that Van Til engaged at a profound and programmatic level. Now, as we start to move in the direction of grasping what common grace is by way of introduction and overview, we need to begin with distinguishing common grace from other forms of grace where confusion might arise. And so we need first to distinguish a Reformed doctrine of common grace from what it is not. Common grace is not what we'll call Arminian prevenient grace. Common grace is not the Arminian doctrine, doctrine of prevenient grace. Remonstrant Arminianism, that version of Arminianism associated with the Synod of Dort in the early 17th century, affirms that human beings after the fall possess a native residual moral ability to repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and be saved. That distinguishes traditional remonstrant Arminianism from the Reformed who affirm a doctrine of total inability and total depravity. But the remonstrant Arminians say that in addition to this native residual ability after the fall to repent and believe the gospel, fallen men and women receive an assistance, a supplement that enables them to cooperate with the overture of the gospel. In their natural state, they receive a supernatural supplement. And that supplement is called prevenient grace. Prevenient grace. It is a remonstrant Arminian conception. Prevenient grace is an indiscriminate but resistible assistance given by God to all people in order that they might freely repent and believe the gospel. Those who appropriate and cooperate with that prevenient grace receive the sufficient grace necessary for salvation. And so you see how prevenient grace, we can call it, is a supernatural supplement to that native residual ability to repent and believe. It's a supernatural supplement to a natural ability that continues after the fall to repent, believe, and please God. This grace, the key, is that the prevenient grace is a propodeutic grace a preparatory grace, a grace that is designed to assist in salvation. That's what makes it distinctive. However, standing over against that, as we've looked at in previous modules, standing over against the doctrine of prevenient grace, the Reformed insist that original sin brings in its wake total inability in and of self, to cooperate with any non-saving overture of God. As Robert Strimple, a professor of mine from Westminster, California, used to say in class, don't forget the Udunatai texts of Romans 8, 7, and 8. The one who is in Adam who has fallen in his sin is not able to keep the commandments of God, is not able to repent and believe. Those after the fall of Adam who descend from him by ordinary generation have lost the moral excellency 
that characterized man before the fall, have lost the moral ability to repent and believe or to prepare themselves to do so. They are not able to cooperate with this non-saving grace. So that helps us understand first that common grace is not prevenient grace. Common grace is not a supernatural supplement to assist people to use their natural residual ability to repent and believe the gospel. It's not a resistible assistance given to people that they might be saved. But secondly, when we're thinking about the Reformed doctrine of common grace, not only do we say it's not prevenient grace, but clearly, but this needs to be said, it is not saving grace. It is not saving. It's not grace that saves. Saving grace comes from the triune God to sinners and can be viewed most broadly in terms of predestining grace. We call that the pactum salutis. Saving grace can be called, we can talk of it in terms of its predestined character. That would be the pactum salutis, which I'll talk about in a moment. We can talk about it in terms of redemption or salvation accomplished. That would be the historia salutis. And we could think of it in terms saving grace applied to sinners in union with Christ. We call that the ordo salutis. Salvation, if you use Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 as a template, it, the, the elect are predestined by the Father. They are redeemed by the Son. And that predestined and accomplished redemption is applied by the Spirit as the Spirit seals Christ to the believer. And so salvation has this ordained, accomplished, and applied Trinitarian character. Let me be a little bit more specific when we talk about saving grace in light of predestination. God the Father, from all eternity, ordained immutably the salvation of his people and elected them in the Son and predestined them to eternal salvation. So Ephesians 1, 4 through 6 teaches this. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5 says that the Father unconditionally elected and personally predestined his people in the eternal Son of God, so that election is not based on foreseen virtues such as holiness or blamelessness, but election results in the holiness and blamelessness of those chosen in the virtue and in the merit of another, the eternal Son of God. Romans 9.10 and following teaches that Jacob was elected unto salvation Esau passed over unto condemnation before either had done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose in election might stand. This is what theologians call the pactum salutis, the eternal Trinitarian decree where the Father sets his unconditional love in the Son on his people. Second. God the Son, in the fullness of time, assumed a true humanity, died as a substitute, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, having accomplished salvation for those given to him before the foundation of the world. So this uh, predestined salvation is accomplished by the Son in time. Ephesians 1, 7 
makes that clear. Ephesians 1, 7, redeemed by his blood, having the forgiveness of sins in the beloved. Paul says elsewhere that our old man, the old man of all of God's elect in Adam, was crucified with Christ. He says that the cross of Jesus delivers the church from the present evil age, Galatians 1.4, and that he lives by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus was not only delivered over to God for our trespasses, but raised for our justification. And so saving grace has a predestining facet. The pactum salutis has an accomplishment facet. What God ordained from all eternity was accomplished in time by the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus Christ, in his two successive estates of suffering and glory, accomplished the salvation of his covenant people. Third, the salvation predestined from all eternity and accomplished in time by Christ is third, applied to the elect as the Spirit works faith in them and unites them to Christ in their effectual call. Ephesians 1, 13 and following talks about the ordo salutis. The Spirit works faith in believers, uniting them to Christ, and in the language of Ephesians 1, 13, seals believers in the promised Spirit. And that Spirit brings Christ to the believer and the believer to Christ. So that Colossians, uh, Ephesians 3, 16 and 17 says that by the Spirit dwelling in the believer, Christ dwells in the heart in a bond that is characterized by fellowship in the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 1, 9. So believers are saved in time when the Spirit sovereignly unites them to Christ. And in Christ they are justified, Galatians 2.16, sanctified, Romans 6.11, adopted, Galatians 3.26, and will be brought to the fullness of the glory in heaven where Christ is in a new heavens and new earth at the end of this age. So while the works of God and salvation are one, and undivided. There is this Trinitarian economy in saving grace. Now, having said this, we now know what common grace is not. It is not prevenient grace found in Remonstrant Arminianism, and it's not the saving grace of redemption predestined, accomplished, and applied by the sovereign grace that is given in Jesus Christ. So what is common grace? How are we to define common grace? What's an initial working definition of common grace? Well, in order to do that, we need to put up on the board a, a, a diagram that will represent, at minimum, history. The history of special revelation. and especially the movement from creation to fall and the promise of redemption. Creation being represented by this portion of our uh, box here, pre-fall. The fall being represented here as this line that occasions a transition from the estate of innocency to the estate of sin and misery that requires, I'm going to keep redemption off the board for now, that requires a third estate, an estate of redemption. Common grace 
is going to be situated in terms of our theology of creation and fall, at least initially. Remember, this is introductory, and we're going to talk in greater detail later. But John Murray, in his collected writings, gives us one of the better definitions of common grace, and he defines it as follows. Common grace is, quote, any blessing of any degree short of salvation that the sin-cursed world enjoys at the hand of God. Any degree, any blessing short of salvation that the sin-cursed world enjoys at the hand of God. So as you note this definition, notice that Murray, if we think of John Murray's definition, Common grace is a post-fall reality on his definition. Now, Van Til's going to say something a little bit more programmatic about common grace, but we're not there yet. And he says it is any blessing short of salvation shown by God, given by God to creatures particularly image bearers. This is a, a kind of economic summary of what I gave you more fully. So common grace now is any blessing of any sort short of salvation that the sin-cursed world enjoys at the hand of God. Let me make three basic points about this definition. First, notice that common grace is grace enjoyed by a sin-cursed world. So on Murray's definition, common grace is any favor of God shown to fallen image bearers in a fallen world. Any good gift of any degree short of salvation shown to a sinner is an example of common grace. <coughs> Rain, sun, daily bread, life, breath, and anything else short of salvation qualifies as common grace. And so you see built into this, this, this terminology here, short of salvation, that's to make sure we have a categorical distinction between saving and common grace. So that's the first point in Murray's definition. It's the benevolence of God the blessing of God short of salvation shown to a sin-cursed world. Secondly, let the emphasis fall on the noun in our formulation, common grace. Common grace. By the noun in the phrase, here's what Murray means, and this will help you navigate this issue more clearly. He means by grace, in this phrase, common grace, non-redemptive favor. Non-redemptive favor. Favor that comes from God to sinners undifferentiated in history. The good things or the good gifts, short of salvation, derive from God and are expressions of his favor to all creatures. So when you define grace in conjunction with its qualifying adjective here, common, non-redemptive favor that is indiscriminate. And that leads us to the third point. Let the emphasis fall on the adjective in our phrase common. The best and simplest way I know to put it is the common means not restricted to the redeemed alone. It is a favor from God, a blessing from God, short of salvation, shown without discrimination, without differentiation to believer and unbeliever alike. I'm not going to talk about degrees of common grace or degrees of blessing, 
That would take us beyond the introductory level at this point. But the gifts of common grace are given equally to believer and unbeliever alike. It's common in that sense. Now, with that definition in place, we can start to see that we're dealing with the history of special revelation and the issue that common grace is pinpointing is the relation between a righteous, holy, and wrathful God and those who have fallen in Adam. Common grace frames that relation. Now, historically, it's important to note that John Calvin laid much of the groundwork for the Reformed doctrine of common grace as Murray defines it. But Calvin brings into view something missing in Murray's definition, something that certainly could enhance that definition. And when we think about Calvin and Calvin's contribution on this issue, he emphasized in his work the non-saving work of the Holy Spirit. The non-saving work of the Holy Spirit. In restraining sin, in testifying to the goodness of God in His general revelation, and in His giving good gifts to His creatures. Calvin emphasized this threefold function of the Holy Spirit in common grace. He restrains sin, gives good gifts to sinners, undifferentiated in history, and testifies to the goodness of God in his general revelation. Let me give you just a few places where Calvin speaks this way. In the Institutes, book two, 12 through 17 for the key sections. He argues for three basic premises that forge a Reformed doctrine of common grace. First, God is the source of all creaturely goodness. One, two, one. It will not suffice simply to hold that there is a one whom all ought to honor and adore unless we are also persuaded that he is the fountain of every good, and that we must seek nothing elsewhere than in him. This I take to mean that no drop will be found, either of wisdom and light, or of righteousness or power or rectitude, or of genuine truth which does not flow from him, and of which He is not the cause. Notice that Calvin affirms that God is the source or fountain of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. He's echoing James to the effect that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. James 1.17 a text that joins the immutability of the Father's person to the very good gifts that he gives to his creatures in time. Calvin says here what the Reformed tradition and behind him the universal Catholic tradition maintains that God is the summum bonum, the supreme good from which all others are derived. In other words, the triune God, is the source and sustainer of all creaturely good, whether you're talking about pre-fall or post-fall history. He and he alone, as Herman Bovink noted, is the abundant fountain of all creaturely good. Nothing in the universe is able to produce goodness unless the triune and good creator is its wellspring. Genesis 131, at the end of the creation week, God said all of his works were very good. 
Now, just as an aside, so you're clear about this, Calvin and Bavink make clear that this derivation of goodness in the work of creation is not a participation in the essence of God as taught by traditional Roman Catholic theology, most notably, but not exclusively, Thomas Aquinas. As we've said in other modules, and I'll just turn you to that, Aquinas taught the intellect of the creature comes to be ontologically reproportioned by deifying grace, and the imperfect participation in God's goodness is perfected by that deifying grace. When Bavink and Calvin speak of God as the source of all good, they are speaking of that in, in a way that distances themselves categorically from this Roman Catholic doctrine of participating in the goodness of God essentially. Bavink, as we've seen, denies this participation, denies this donum superadditum, calls its fruition a substantial union and a melting union between the creator and the creature. And so you can revisit that material from a previous module, but here's the point. Whatever good there is in creation before or after the fall, it finds its actuating source in God, the giver of every good and perfect gift. So if you're asking the question, how do we find goodness in creatures? The answer, God. Second, Calvin says this, the unregenerate are by nature, after the fall, capable of nothing truly good in God's sight and are justly under divine wrath. Listen to what he says in 2, 1, 8 and 9, page 252 of the Battles Institutes. He says, first, we are so vitiated and perverted in every part of our nature that by this great corruption we stand justly condemned and convicted before God to whom nothing is acceptable but righteousness, innocence, and purity. Second, perversity never ceases in us but continually bears new fruits, the works of the flesh that we have already described just as a burning furnace gives forth flame and sparks, or water ceaselessly bubbles up from a spring. Our nature is not only destitute and empty of good, but so fertile and fruitful of every evil that it cannot be idle. Those who have said that original sin is concupiscence have not used an appropriate word. Whatever is in man has been defiled and crammed with this concupiscence. Or to put it more briefly, the whole man is of himself nothing but concupiscence. End of quote. In Calvin's estimate, and we've made this clear uh, in, in different modules, uh, both in the Van Til course and in the Union with Christ course, Fallen man by nature is depraved in every faculty, reason, will, and affection, and in those old Udunatai texts, not able to please God. Now, what do, you, what do you start to see? You start to see that whatever is good in the creature is given by God, point one. But point two, sin, sin, original and actual sin, permeates every aspect of the image-bearing creature, rendering the creature crammed, in Calvin's language, with concupiscence. Nothing but concupiscence. Totally unable to please God. Now, third, and and relating these two points together, dealing with the tension, Calvin affirms this, that the unregenerate 
receive good gifts from God and make worthy contributions to science, please hear this, in light of the non-saving, common work of the Holy Spirit. And so on the one side, God gives every good and perfect gift. On the other side, the sinner is wholly or entirely or comprehensively defiled in mind, in will, and in affections. But the unregenerate make worthy contributions in science not because of any unaffected natural faculty, untainted by sin, but because of a non-saving work of the Spirit. This is Calvin's insight. Listen to what he says, 2.2.16 of the Institutes. Meanwhile, we ought not to forget that those most excellent benefits of the divine spirit, which he distributes according to whomever he wills for the common good of mankind. It is no wonder then that the knowledge of all that is most excellent in human life is said to be communicated to us through the Spirit of God. Pause. There's more in this quote, but pause there for a moment. What is he saying? In light of the two previous points, God gives every good and perfect gift. Adam's sin vitiates the whole of human nature, corrupting it at its core. Not simply a loss of supernatural gifts like traditional Roman Catholics say, but it is the vitiation, the corruption of the whole nature. So how do we explain the worthwhile contributions to science or philosophy or art among those who are totally depraved. He says the function of the Spirit of God and the benefits of the Divine Spirit distributing according to His will. He goes on to say this. We ought to understand the statement that the Spirit of God dwells only in believers, as referring to the spirit of sanctification through whom we are consecrated as temples to God. The Lord fills, moves, and quickens all things by the power of that same spirit and does so according to the character that he bestowed on each by the law of creation. But if the Lord has willed that we are helped in physics, dialectic, mathematics, and other like disciplines, let us use this assistance, for we, if we neglect God's gift, freely offered in these arts, we ought to suffer just punishment for our sins and our sloth. Now, Calvin's affirming here that the contributions made by unregenerate are not the result of natural properties unaffected by sin whether it's the natural gifts in traditional Roman Catholic theology and all that's lost are the supernatural gifts on top, or whether it's that remonstrant Arminian view that human nature has a residual natural capacity to do what is good and cooperate with the overtures of non-saving grace. Neither of those are affirmed by Calvin. He is not taking a traditional Roman Catholic view that only supernatural gifts are lost. He's not taking a yet-to-be-fully-developed remonstrant Arminian view that there's a residual natural capacity. There's a, there, are, there are features of the human person not tainted and spoiled by sin. He's taking neither of those views. And he's attributing the contributions to the non-saving gifts communicated by the Holy Spirit. And so if you take the two views together here, if you take Murray's definition, what is common grace? Common grace is any blessing of any degree short of salvation that the sin-cursed world enjoys at the hand of God. And you add to it Calvin's view, Calvin's insistence that this accrues by virtue of the non-saving work of the Holy Spirit, you have a robust pneumatic definition and conception of common grace. Now Murray, summarizing ably Calvin's thinking here over against traditional Roman Catholicism and Arminianism, 
says this, uh, and this is volume 294 of his collected writings. He says, the most certain and easy solution to this question, however, is that those virtues, the virtues that we were just talking about in Calvin, those virtues are not the common properties of nature, but the peculiar graces of God, which he dispenses in great variety and in certain degree to men that are otherwise profane. Now pause and hear that quote one more time. After the fall, the empirical virtues that we see in the unregenerate are not the common properties of nature. In other words, it's not nature unaffected by sin. It is instead the peculiar graces of God dispensed great variety in certain degree to men that are otherwise profane. He goes on to say now, the elect alone are sanctified by the Spirit. They alone are healed of sin. They alone are created anew. But all creatures, by the energy of the same Spirit, are replenished, actuated, and quickened according to the property of each species which he has given it by the law of creation. Now, what Murray does not make explicit, but we need to make explicit, is that Calvin denies every form of nature-grace dualism in his theology. Nature entirely affected by sin, and the Spirit, non-saving work, those are the two limiting conceptions that drive his doctrine of common grace. And so, as you begin to think about common grace in an introductory way, common grace does not ameliorate the antithesis does not ameliorate the corruption of nature. It highlights that corruption. It underscores that corruption. Common grace, as we've said, is not prevenient grace. It doesn't soften and prepare a heart for salvation. Common grace, unlike saving grace, doesn't redeem anyone. Common grace instead, in Calvin's view, is given in a context of fall and sin, where there are no natural endowments that remain fundamentally unaffected by the fall. So when you think about a reformed doctrine of sin that frames common grace, you have to recognize common grace assumes that all properties, all propensions, all faculties are enslaved to sin, and the only way to account for any relative good in image bearers is through the non-saving gifts of God distributed by the Spirit according to His will. This alone does justice to the total depravity and spiritual and moral antithesis between the believer and the unbeliever, and this alone is the anthropological foundation that renders the doctrine of common grace necessary in the first place. Common grace does not find a need in the semi-Pelagianism of traditional Roman Catholic theology or the semi-Pelagianism of remonstrant Arminian theology. It finds a home only where there is a full-orbed doctrine of sin as total depravity and total inability. On that anthropological foundation, Calvin says, we need a doctrine of common grace. So Calvin's three premises, that God is the source of all good, man is thoroughly corrupt in every faculty due to Adam's original sin after the fall, and third, God gives 
every good and perfect gift and makes contributions of sinners possible through the non-saving work of the Holy Spirit. Calvin's three premises cohere on three assumptions that I need to make explicit. First, a rejection of semi-Pelagianism, whether it's the Roman Catholic form of the natural and supernatural gifts where the fall brings a loss only of the supernatural gifts. It's a rejection of the semi-Pelagianizing trend of remonstrant Arminianism, that the supernatural grace of God called prevenient grace, assisting that residual natural ability to cooperate and believe. Calvin's rejecting that kind of construction as well. So first, it's a rejection of semi-Pelagianism in traditional Roman Catholic or any form of traditional Arminianism. Secondly, he's affirming an Augustinian doctrine of total inability. So no Pelagianism and no semi-Pelagianism, Augustinianism. And third, in light of that, he affirms common grace. I've said it before, I'll just say it one more way. Common grace proceeds on the rejection of all forms of Pelagian and semi-Pelagian anthropology and proceeds squarely on an Augustinian foundation. Now to focus this point more clearly, and to bring it down to a simpler expression, Calvin's saying two things. One, sinners in Adam are wholly corrupt, totally depraved, totally unable to please God in themselves or cooperate with the overtures of non-saving grace. And secondly, those who are totally depraved are capable of doing what is good in observable moral categories. Calvin's view on this point is expressed with typical clarity and economy and given a concrete example in Westminster Confession 167. Uh, the section on good works. This is the fruition of Calvin's doctrine of common grace in light of total depravity. Hear it, listen. Works done by unregenerate men, although for the matter of them they may be things which God commands, and of good use both to themselves and others, Yet because they proceed not from a heart purified by faith, nor are done in a right manner according to the word, nor to a right end the glory of God, they are therefore sinful and cannot please God or make a man fit to receive the grace of God. And yet the neglect of them is more sinful and displeasing to God. Now, note what the confession is saying here. There are works that are done by unregenerate men that might be what God commands and might be of some use to both themselves and others. We'll call that civic good, observable good, uh, what, what we might call good in light of observable moral categories. But those good works, quote-unquote, are not pleasing to God for three fundamental reasons. The goal, the motive, and the standard fall short of the glory of God. In order for an unregenerate person to do a truly good work that pleases God, it has to be from a heart purified by faith. It has to have the right motive, faith in Jesus Christ. It also has to be done according to the right manner, according to the Word of God. So the standard has to be the Word of God. And third, the end or goal must be the glory of God. The confession then makes a very helpful distinction between the matter of a good work and the manner of a good work. 
Both believers and unbelievers can perform good works as it were. But only the unbelie- only the believer pursues good works according to the proper goal, motive, and standard. In fact, Van Til, in Essays on Christian Education, making reference to Heidelberg Shorter Catechism 91, says and this, what is, uh, page three, what is a good work, asks the catechism. This is Van Til. The answer is that a good work, a work that is pleasing to God, is one that is A, done to His glory, B, that is done according to the standard of the Word of God, and three, whose motivation springs from faith. The goal, standard, and motive proceed in that way. And he goes on to say, such good works are found only in the lives of those who are bought with the precious blood of Christ. So, if you ask the question, how is it that those who are otherwise totally dead in sin, averse to God, and incapable of pleasing God, can do those good works that are observably good, even though they fall short in terms of goal, motive, and standard, the reference that we have to the non-saving work of the Spirit that restrains sin, gives good gifts, and testifies to the goodness of God, that is where we look. It is not natural properties unaffected by sin. It is the common non-saving grace of God's Spirit that explains this phenomenon. That's an antithesis between Calvinism on the one side and all forms of semi-Pelagianism, Roman Catholic and Protestant alike, on the other side. Now to move on. Van Til, in your reading, Common Grace and the Gospel, talks about a controversy in the Christian Reformed Church that came to a head and a seminal expression in 1924, which are summarized as what we might call the three points that define the common grace controversy. There are five points of Calvinism, three points of common grace. Now, let me give you a way to distinguish classical Calvinism from the alternatives of hyper-Calvin, alternative of hyper, so-called hyper-Calvinism of the Protestant Reformed, Herman Hooksema, David Engelsma, and others. Here are the three points, and these are in your reading, but I think it's worth our time for me to expand on them so that you are focused in on the basics. First, the first point of, of, that defines common grace more fully, God shows a non-redemptive favor toward all of his creatures after the fall. God shows a non-redemptive favor to all of his creatures after the the fall. Some scriptural support for this thesis is not hard to find. Isaiah 26.10, even though the wicked is shown favor, he does not learn righteousness. Now, more than likely, this refers to God demonstrating favor toward the reprobate who do not repent and believe. But Matthew 5.44-46 clearly teaches that God causes the Son to and the rain to fall on the righteous and the wicked, and that benevolence does not discriminate between the righteous and the wicked. In fact, God giving these good gifts to the reprobate is in part why Jesus commands us to love our enemies. God is showing a non-redemptive favor to those he has ordained unto eternal damnation. That favor in time is authentic and real. Second, God, without renewing the heart, restrains sin and withholds wrath in order to allow for social order. Genesis 20, verse 6 speaks of God restraining Abimelech 
from sin. Romans 1, 24 and following demonstrates the consequences of God lifting the restraining influence of sin among the Gentiles, which presupposes a prior restraint. 2 Corinthians 2, 6 speaks of God restraining the man of lawlessness. And so, common grace not only is a non-redemptive favor that God shows the wicked, but it is a non-saving restraint of sin and a withholding of wrath to allow for social order and most basically, to allow for the gospel to move forward in time as the mechanism for the discrimination or differentiation between the elect and the reprobate. Third, without renewing the heart of man, God influences him to perform acts that are good in a civic sense, although they miss the proper goal, motive, and standard of true obedience point we just made from Westminster Confession 16.7 and page 3 of Van Til's Christ Essays on Christian Education. Second Kings, for instance, speaks of many good deeds performed by Jehu. Mark 6.33 speaks of sinners who do good to those who do good to them. And so these three points help us begin to wrestle with something we're going to look at much more profoundly the discrimination or differentiation that God makes between the elect and the reprobate in eternity does not mean that God in history fails to show favor equally to both as they are undifferentiated, as they are fallen in Adam. Now this is a summary overview that gets you to the point where you can begin to appreciate what Van Til is going to add to this discussion. In our next section, we're going to begin to probe Van Til's own development of the doctrine of common grace, and all of these features in our introduction supply the categories that Van Til took for granted. So as you read Van Til, you now have before you the categories he took for granted and then sought to develop. So this really truly is merely a, an introduction and overview, a prolegomena to Van Til. We have not yet gotten to Van Til proper. And the three main topics that will occupy our attention in order will be first, the Holy Spirit, natural revelation and common grace, what I call the new relation of Adam to God after the fall and the antithesis. We'll talk about that, the Holy Spirit, natural revelation, common grace, the new relation after the fall and the antithesis. Secondly, we're going to spend a great bit of time on the positive line of concrete thinking and Van Til's distinction of earlier and later grace. Van Til's solution or his proposed way to develop our theology of common grace is that we need to be concrete in our thinking, concrete in our Trinitarian theology, concrete in our doctrine of the decree, concrete in our conception of image and covenant. And then third, we're going to deal with fearless anthropomorphism and God's relation to Adam and those he represents before and after the fall. And we will have to be somewhat polemical at that point due to recent uh, publications that have brought significant confusion and misunderstanding with regard to Van Til's teaching. We'll address that at point. But let me give you the thesis up front. Let me summarize the coming uh, course uh, in, in terms of its development and argument. The thesis up front, as that Van Til seeks to answer the issues that arise in common grace by applying the representational principle we've looked at in our previous modules. Remember, the representational principle is very simple to explain. 
It is classically reformed Trinitarianism, Old Amsterdam, Old Princeton, Calvin's Doctrine of Autotheos, classically reformed Trinitarianism and historic reformed federalism, image and covenant, applied to all forms of correlativism, whether medieval, ancient medieval, or modern. The representational principle is classical reformed Trinitarianism and historic uh, confessional federalism applied to all forms of correlativism. That's precisely what Van Til is going to seek to apply to the common great debate, common grace debate. First, Van Til, by way of summary, will take the Trinity as his concrete starting point, reason fearlessly that the Trinity relates to history and gives it meaning without being changed or determined by history. That's what fearless anthropomorphism means. It's not that God changes and becomes like the creature, and we fearlessly affirm that. Fearless anthropomorphism is that we maintain fearlessly that God is not changed and not determined by the creature in his sovereign relation to creation. Tr listen, true concreteness for Van Til means beginning with the immutable and self-contained Trinity who decrees whatsoever comes to pass and gives history and secondary causes its meaning and authenticity. That's the argument in a nutshell. So concreteness is ontological trinity, decree, and how God, as the self-contained and immutable triune God, gives meaning to history and secondary causes. The second main strand of our argument. Van Til will take the reformed philosophy of history, which we covered in our previous module, the natural and supernatural revelation of God in his condescension to the creature and apply a concrete understanding of that philosophy of history to the issues of common grace. He'll stress that to reason in fearless anthropomorphism is to maintain the immutable decree of God and his condescension to Adam and creation are limiting conceptions. We don't reason from one to the neglect of the other or from the other to the neglect of the one. We reason in terms of both God's eternal decree and the authentic historical revelation that he gives to Adam as covenant head. This will allow Van Til to speak both of an ultimate differentiation of the elect and reprobate in the decree and a bona fide commonality among them in covenant history. And we'll see how he does that. In particular, Van Til will argue that the positive line of concrete thinking will help us grasp that while God, before the foundation of the world, categorically and absolutely discriminated between the elect and the reprobate. Nonetheless, in history, he extended common favor to all elect and reprobate in Adam. That point is the starting point for Van Til's concept of earlier grace, a common covenantal favor God shows to all in Adam where they are not yet discriminated in history, even though in the decree there has been a full, comprehensive differentiation between elect and reprobate. So really, the common grace issue here builds directly on what we have developed in the previous two modules. The self-contained, immutable triune God as such relates to history in creation and special providence and gives it and everything within it its authenticity, its meaning. This is the positive line of concrete thinking. And so keep this in mind as the lectures develop, and if you need to return to this material, you can come back and review it because it will keep you on track as we develop Van Til's line of argument from the concrete ontological trinity the decree of God, and then the process of differentiation, commonality and differentiation in history in light of God's conditional covenantal 
revelation to man. And so now, with this introduction in place, we can move forward and start to deal with the distinctive contributions of Van Til to this critical doctrine of common grace in relation to the gospel.